I'm recording this session so you can access this um, down the road if you want. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and kick it off. So my name again is Jim Thompson for those of you uh, who I haven't met or been introduced to um, when you first dialed in. Um, I'm the president of Concentric Management Systems. We like to shorten that and just go by Concentric. It's a mouthful. Um, we were founded in 2003 up in Columbus, Indiana, and then moved uh, from the state of Indiana down to, to South Carolina in 2010. And um, we have uh, kind of our headquarters in downtown Charleston and then subject matter experts that are kind of all over the place. Um, there are typically three to five of us in this office that kind of run the operations uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we have a, a pretty strong presence in kind of the Indiana up to Milwaukee area and then a, a group um, kind of Charleston down to, to Florida, southeast coast. Uh, like I said, feel free to ask any questions that, that come up. The more questions you ask, the more interesting it is to watch the video in the future. Um, other folks you know, may have similar questions to you. This particular forum is the eighth forum in a series that was started in um, August 2013. And what we try to do, especially as the standard uh, gets closer and closer to um, the international standard release, is we try to do at least once a month. Typically, it's on uh, a Wednesday, the last Wednesday of the month, right in the middle of the day, kind of a lunch and learn. Um, some folks choose to take um, the video and actually sit down with their auditors or the management staff and do a lunch and learn and actually watch the video at another time. I actually have a customer that's doing that um, today. So um, feel free to to do that, feel free to pass this along to suppliers. It doesn't cost anything, it's, it's short. You know, for me, it's just a way uh, for us to kind of get the name of Concentric out there so, so we're recognized in the marketplace as a, as a resource should the time come that you need help. So that's a bit of the commercial side of things. So I'm gonna be focusing this presentation, as I said, on the risk-based thinking changes, which is um, really looking as if it's going to be the biggest change. I mean, there are the numbering, you know, shuffling of the numbers type changes and some of the other things that, that a lot of us are going to have to deal with. But um, the concept of risk-based thinking is, is a, a rather large change. And um, it's actually, there's, we had a pre-conference workshop last Wednesday before the Low Country Quality Conference. Um, and I taught that workshop, it was eight hours ex exclusively uh, to focus on risk-based thinking. So it is a, a rather deep dive um, topic. So we'll spend probably about 15 to 20 minutes of this hour talking about that. So the projected changes and the timeline of the projected changes. So back in June, 2012 um, is when the initial discussion of the review of ISO 9001 uh, and its associated documents started. And we're looking at um, September, if, uh, if no strange uh, conversations or, or major changes occur, which is really not expected. So September, October timeframe is, is the projected timeline for that release. <clears throat> so just the kind of a blitz through um, the top three management system standards and how they align. I don't want to spend too much time on these three so I can put more time towards the risk-based thinking. But you know, the current 9,000 family has the eight clause structure. There's 1.2 million organizations globally that are registered. So they're certified, they have this piece of paper that says you, know, you, you meet the minimum requirements. That's a crazy big number. So think about all of the additional organizations that may use 9001 as the baseline for their quality system and they're not registered. So it's got to be in the two to three million. So it's a very, very, very large international standard. It's the, the most widely used standard, um, 140 plus countries. We're at Rev4. 
basically now, and, and the next one will be the, the fifth uh, revision. Uh, 14,001, a very similar management system audit, but it's for environment. Um, quality is 18 element or 18 clauses, EMS and the uh, OHS, which is uh, occupational health and safety. They're both 17 elements. Um, so there's oftentimes some difficulty in aligning the two, two or three standards if you're trying to integrate you know, the three management systems and just how you do business. Um, that's going to become easier, and I'll show you a couple of slides here that will explain that further. But you can see the environmental management system also has a very large presence, 200,000-plus registrations globally, um, currently on Rev 2, going to Rev 3. And the OHS system is uh, the health and safety that's really documented, created in parallel with EMS. So a lot of times what you'll see is companies refer to their um, 14,000 and 18,000 system together as HSE, uh, health, safety, and environment, just kind of all packaged together. Um, there's not as much of a global presence with um, with the 18,001 because it hasn't been an international standard yet. So sometimes you'll hear people say ISO 18,001. It's actually, there is an ISO 18,001 document, but it has nothing to do with occupational health and safety. Um, the current document is actually BS OHSAS, which is a British standard. Um, in late 2015, early 2016, there will actually be the first release of the uh, OHNS standard, which would actually have the number ISO 45001. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, I would suspect that major OEMs, major you know, global organizations will really start to um, push their supply chain um, towards, you know, being more corporately responsible, socially responsible, you know, with, with both a, a growth in the demand for the environmental side and the health and safety, you know, of their, their workforce and their associates. <clears throat> so that's a bit of a, a quick blitz on the standards. Um, this shows a timeline kind of corresponding to one of the, I think it was slide number two, where June 2012, um, Really, the, the question was, do we revise the standard? Do we use the standard as is, or does this standard become obsolete? And this is kind of the, uh, the, the phases that that standard, the 9001 standard, um, has gone through since June 2012. Um, this was an illustration that, um, that I pulled from Quality Digest uh, from last year. Before I go any further, are there any questions at this point? Hey, my screen sharing still shows as pause. Is that, how do I, there we go. Thank you. Still shows as pause, yikes. Yeah, I, it's up now. Okay, that was my fault. Thanks. I, I paused <laughs> Thanks. it. That'll teach you to be quiet and not yell at me earlier. So it was Sorry. stuck on the first. It was stuck on the first slide. Uh, it didn't have any was, slides. Oh, even even worse. So yeah. first slide. Here's the first slide. That's me. Here's the rules. We went through that. Here's the yeah. little illustration. June through September. Um. There's the slide for nine thousand. Fourteen thousand. And eighteen thousand. Okay. Okay. Soon to be for, soon to be forty five thousand and one. So I'm glad I asked the question. And uh, here you go with the that illustration I said I pulled from Quality Digest. Okay. Thanks. All right. So you can see um, this little illustration here shows the distribution globally. This is a, a few years old now, but. Uh, the distribution globally of all the, the 9001 cert, uh, certification or, or registrations that have been issued globally. Um, 
no surprise that China is is way up there. Um, the United States is down in, in ninth place. Um, Germany is kind of there in the middle, but Germany actually has the biggest concentration, um, so the biggest per capita of uh, QMS registrations. That doesn't surprise me. You know, the Germans are, are typically very uh, progressive. Uh, same with Japan in, in the on the quality side of things. <clears throat> but there's a, another interesting um, statistic here, or figure, and that's there are 16,500 standards that um, ISO is in charge of publishing and updating and maintaining. So uh, the 9001 document is just one of those many, um, you know, one of 16,500 plus standards, which is uh, a lot of standards to manage. So there are committees within um, ISO. Um, there's a, a committee called TC176, which is the number given to a group of delegates from different countries that sit around the table and argue about the details of the 9000 family. So within that technical committee 176, you also see that there are three subcommittees. There's one subcommittee that focuses on 9000, one that focuses on 9001 and 9004, and then a, a subcommittee um, that focuses on this new document called ISO uh, 10,000 series. So I'll get to what that 10,000 series, series is here in just a second. So in uh, some of the earlier phases of the discussion of revising the standard, there were surveys that were sent out and there were over 12,000 responses back from subscribers, uh, technical experts saying, uh, here's what we think needs to happen in terms of the updates to the international standard. Uh, 122 countries collected those responses and then fed those back into TC-176, and that became the primary input for um, the draft and the direction of, of where we see the standard going uh, right now. So we are at um, kind of the, the top of this stair step. The, uh, the DIS, or Draft International Standard, <clears throat> was submitted for vote and approved in November of um, 2014 by nearly 90%, which is pretty, um, pretty outstanding that 90% or so of the voting members said, we agree with the direction of this draft move forward. So right now we're in this FDIS, or Final Draft International Standard phase, and that comes up in um, in June, um, I believe it's June or July, I don't know the exact date, but that will be voted on. If that passes, which is expected to pass, um, then the international standard would be published um, a couple of months after that. So there are some sector-specific connections, obviously, automotive, aerospace, uh, medical, telecommunications. So. What, what those standards are basically waiting on or those sector specific standards are waiting on um, is that release of 9001 because you know one third or one half of their specific standard in say automotive uh, for TS 16 you know it, it, the, the core of that or the, the, the bottom half of that standard so to speak or the text that's in the box if you're looking at those standards all come from 9001. So think of, um, I used this analogy last week, as bad as it was, I liked it. Think of 9001 as like Mr. Potato Head, and then these sectors coming along, and you know, 9000 is the potato with no parts in it, and then aerospace or automotive come along and put their little, you know, eyeballs on the top and, you know, funky hats and feet and all that sort of thing. So that um, that will be a, a a following result probably in Q1 Q2 of um, 2016. So there's a document called Annex LS. One of the questions from a previous forum was, "What does LS mean?" Well, the answer is the same as you know, what does 16949 or 
forty-five thousand and one. What do those mean? They mean nothing. It's just a, a serial number. It's basically the the next number or the next uh, alpha characters in line that have been assigned to a specific document. So this document called Annex LS is really a standard for management system standards. So Annex LS is a framework that says, hey, look, guys, if you're going to publish a new management system standard, that's fine. The technical committees can can go up on their own and 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 see the uh, the upgrades or the changes from discussion all the way to release. But just make sure that the contents and the layout are all structured in this one through ten structure. So what that means is, if you're looking at um, a health and safety system, if you're looking at an environmental system, um, you know. Each of each of these three management systems will now have the same numbering scheme. So if you're going to um, write a procedure or policy or some sort of documentation on leadership, well, clause five will be the same clause irrespective of which of the three standards you're you're talking about. So I'm I'm really excited about that because the majority of our customers that we work with are very large international global companies. They all have initiatives to control health and safety and environmental and quality. So this is going to help those folks that are responsible for those systems to, to maintain the system, to design the system, to, to use, for example, um, internal auditing. If you have internal auditors, why have three internal auditing procedures? Why have three internal auditing teams. Um, so it's, you know, that's going to be a very positive effect with the alignment that Annex LS um, forces these standards to now um, subscribe to. Any questions? Okay, just want to make sure I pause to ask the question just in case this time somebody would say uh, the audio is not on and then I, and then I would fail all around. <laughs> all right, I'm going to go to the next slide. So what's the expectation in terms of transition? Um, first and foremost, I would make sure that you're in good communication now with your registrar and with your customers. Um, there's an expected three-year transition from basically September 2015 to September 2018, but your customer can come along at any time and say, "We're not. We don't want you to wait till 2018." Or your registrar could say, um, "You need to transition um, earlier." It, it, it's not only possible, but um, it happened with um, Daimler Chrysler tier one suppliers back in uh, the early 2000s. So when TS 16949 was released based on the 9001 changes from the 1994 version to the 2000 version, um, Daimler Chrysler said, uh, surprise, if, if you're doing business directly with us, you only have 18 months. So don't wait to get surprised with that. I mean, uh, there are a lot of suppliers that were at that tier one level that, um, you know, they just kind of, oh, here's another letter from, from Daimler Chrysler, I'll throw it in the trash and, you know, really kind of set some companies spinning out of control. Three years is a, is a, you know, a decent amount of time to transition, but if, if that gets cut in half by your customer, um, you, you need to get on the ball right now in in the transition don't wait until the last quarter 2018 you're i mean there's going to be a massive massive traffic jam that's what happened back in in 2003 um everybody wanted to wait until the last minute and the registrars simply couldn't handle the bandwidth they didn't have enough auditors you know you all know i would i would bet that at least 75% on the call right now have 
you have <clears throat> you have your surveillance audits in the fourth quarter. You know, don't do that, especially the fourth quarter 2018. Uh, you, it's just going to be a train wreck. So don't wait. You know, even if you could move your audit cycle to the middle of the year or earlier in the year, I would say Q2, Q3, um, that's going to help with the congestion that we're going to see late in 2018. So here again is kind of the structure, the layout of the standards. And what you'll see is similar to what we what we have now. You know, all the stuff kind of here, clause one, two, and three is really kind of preface stuff. And these sections here, which currently are five clauses, clause five through eight, now are going to be clause four through ten. So there are seven clauses that will be um, a part of the new release where you'll see the, the requirements. Um, so, your so go ahead. So I've got a question. Like, I'm yeah. certified to the AS spec, AS9100. Mm -hmm. So ISO yes. is obviously the foundation for all of the specs. Uh -huh. So my numbering system will also change, I assume? Yes. So now when would I, be the rollout? Like, do you know when the rollout would be for, like, AS9100? I will know more next week. Okay. I can tell you this. The chairman of that technical committee spoke at the World Conference last year, and I sat in and actually asked him a couple of questions during the um, during one of his talks. Um, the aerospace technical committees are on board with the changes. They're in agreement with the alignment of the changes and, and reshuffling the deck, so to speak, so that AS9100C or D, whatever the next rev is going to be, It'll be D. Aligns with not. What, what's that? It'll be D. D, it's, I it's assume so. Right now, so it will be going yeah. D. Okay. So I cannot say the same thing about the automotive industry. Right now, they're still kind of sitting there with their arms crossed, being pouty little babies because they don't like, somebody doesn't like, and I don't know why. Um, the the new approach that 9001 is taking automotive is a pain in the butt yep. that's where i for some reason spend the majority of my life i question that at times but you know come on guys you have to make a decision because there's a lot of companies that need to start planning now um i reached out to the um the communications director at AIAG up in Detroit and asked what's going on. We have webinars. People are asking questions on the automotive side. And his response was basically, you'll know when the rest of the world knows. Mm -hmm. So I used to work up in Auburn Hills around some of these guys, and I just want to, you know, strangle them sometimes with the arrogance. I, the the uh, aerospace folks don't, seem to be so tightly wound, at least as it, as it relates to following the structure and building on top of it. Good question. Uh, okay. there's, another, there's another kind of three sections that are going to be added, and it's called Annex A. Um, Annex A is clarification. Annex B is QMS principles. And then Annex C is uh, the QMS family of standards, which is the ISO 10,000 series. I'll, I'll cover that in just a second. Um, I'm going to start highlighting a couple of the, you know, kind of major changes. So are there any other questions before I, I jump into that? Okay. I'm going to go through this uh, rather quickly as well and then slow down a bit for the risk piece so we can do a bit more deeper dive there. But um, the first section here is um, context of organization. So in short, it's very similar to what we see right now with, with Clause 4.1. Um, I think it's A through E or A through G, something like that. The, the very first requirements of the current standard 
there's just a little bit more meat that that is required uh, that's going to be required with the new revision and that is you need to more clearly define right up front what is your organization you know when you say we are certified to or we are registered to and you got and you announced that to uh, the marketplace what do you mean by we you know what are all your processes what are the internal versus external processes um, who are your interested parties where's that fence line so I like this illustration because it, um, you know, it goes hand in hand. This is 4.1 is context of the organization. 4.3 gets a little bit uh, deeper. You know, where's your fence line? Where's your responsibility start and end? Where are you subbing out a process? Uh, where are you? Um, what 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 processes are heavily dependent on someone that's in a sister plant? Um, a supplier, uh, maybe contract labor, uh, interns, contractors, other contingency workers. So you need to define that very, very clearly um, up front. And, you know, that just makes sense to do anyway. You know, let's name all of the parts of our management system and make sure that all of our team members and, uh, you know, from the management on down, understand what all the pieces of, of the machine are you know what are we as an organization um, another subtle change here uh, which we see already with um, AS and TS on the automotive and aerospace side and, and some of the other standards um, we need to have better alignment of the quality management system and business objectives so that's what that's the little um, illustration towards the bottom the QMS and the, the business management system you know, quality objectives and the business planning and that sort of thing need to be compatible in the same direction. Um, top management is not a term that's used, uh, which is fine by me. Um, leadership replaces that term, top management. So you'll start to hear um, quite a few changes and some keywords that are probably uh, more aligned in the nomenclature of the uh, the executive or the, the the leaders of your organization leadership is one of those um, qms planning so 6.1 this is where um, risk-based thinking is is um, introduced the idea is that you you look at all of the parts of your quality management system and you look for opportunities for improvement you look at um, what are some of the threats? What are some of the things that um, could be risks? What are actual risks? Uh, how do we come up with risk-based targets, goals, objectives? You know, getting ahead of uh, problems before they occur, or at least being aware of certain risks and and what your tolerance for that risk would be, what your response to um, risk would be. So. I'm a huge fan of SWOT analysis. If you don't know uh, what SWOT analysis is, it stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So, you know, Google SWOT analysis if you want, and there's a ton of different articles and, and tools and papers on it, but it's just a very simple way to evaluate all of your processes and your management system and, and ask yourself, what are we good at? Uh, what are we bad at or you know, what opportunities, what could we, we be better at, what risks are out there and, and really planning for those things and being very deliberate about um, your view on risk and, and opportunity. So risk, um, at least as it's defined by the current standard, uh, the, the draft international standard um, is the effect of uncertainty on an expected result. Okay, the current draft international standard does not include the, the terms preventive action. So, you know, what, I'm, what I will see, I'm a, a, a lead QMS auditor for 9001, so I go in and do audits of organizations all the time, and I'll see, you know, I'll ask the question, you know, do you have a, a CAPA system or a CAR system and a PAR system? And what I normally see is, you know, a thousand corrective actions and then this one preventive action that was created last week just to kind of 
pacify me as an auditor. Um, I think that by using risk and risk-based thinking, just those terms and the definitions alone are going to help um, subscribers to better understand what the intent is of, you know, this requirement that's all, always been there. It's just maybe it's been a little bit um, implicit as opposed to explicit. So risk, I think, is really going to shine a lot of light on on this proactive approach to uh, known or potential problems. So 6.1 is where um, we see um, risk. We also see risk in change management. But the, the, the idea is, you know, let's evaluate risk. Let's plan for risk. Um, what's acceptable, what's unacceptable? What's the probability of a nonconformity popping up? So if you look at the illustration here uh, of the kind of the three-dimensional model of the home, you know, think about this is your home and you're looking, kind of taking the roof off and you're looking at all of the rooms in a similar way that you'd look at all the processes within your organization and ask yourself, where is the biggest risk? Um, and what are we doing? Let's say kitchen is the biggest risk or fire is the biggest risk. You know, fire is the biggest risk for um, our health and safety. And it's probably going to happen in the kitchen. So let's get together and, and plan for that. You know, let's, you, you can't totally um, prevent fire, but there are provisions you can put in place within reason um, to, to manage that risk should the time come that there, there is a fire. So it's getting you to think in that way in terms of um, your planning, your execution, and, uh, and how you schedule and structure your internal auditing activity. And obviously, you know, high probability, if there's a high probability of a fire and Obviously, having a fire is a very high um, severity. Um, then it's a it's a big darn deal, and you should be spending a lot of time and, and resources evaluating and, and uh, managing that risk. So here's I'm not the best artist in the world. This is about as good as I get here, but um, hopefully this can help you understand a bit, you know, the, the concept of really discovering problems before they get out of control, you know, a smoke detector or a, you know, um, a, a heat sensing gauge on your vehicle, um, the little yellow light and the, the ding on your gas gauge when, when it starts to, your gas starts to get a little bit low. So that's the idea. Let's get ahead of the problem before they get out of control. And then let's, Sometimes you can't detect the problem until it does surface. So you know, let's put controls in place to at least shorten the reaction time and the problem severity, um, you know, when we're able to. So that's getting ahead of, of the problem. Um, here's another example where risk-based thinking kind of looks at uh, prevention, um, getting ahead in, in the timeline getting ahead of the problem before a non-performance or failure mode surfaces, you know, taking action prior to the onset of the non-conformity. So um, here's another example that's kind of um, maybe a, a, a device or a day-to-day -day use item where maybe slapping a, uh, a sign here saying no children around the pool is not the most effective way of handling this. So uh, because the severity could be injury or death, drowning, um, you know, you want to take uh, a higher level of a provision or a prevention measure to mitigate that particular risk. This particular illustration is pointing specifically to um, that little magnetic lock mechanism that you could put um, on the fence so that someone that's shorter than, uh, you know, a, a certain height couldn't get through. Although I've had a lot of people say, well, you don't know my kid, my kid would just climb right over that fence. You know, that's where you have to weigh, um, 
you know, what's reasonable. You know, ideally, yeah, money is no object and you could just buy your way out of every risk, but uh, that, that really doesn't exist. Um, runners stretch prior to strenuous exercise to prevent injury. Um, this particular illustration here shows, um, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I'm going to mute y'all because somebody's getting a little windy. Okay, much better. So here's an example where um, there's a risk of putting your vehicle in drive or putting your vehicle in reverse prior to putting your foot on the brake. Well, in this case, this is a picture of a Toyota Prius. That risk has been designed out of uh, the product, out of the vehicle. Um, you have to depress your foot to the brake before the car even starts. So that's an example of risk-based thinking in terms of product design, putting a, a big sticker on the visor that says depress brake before you put the car in gear or you'll run over somebody, you know, that's not effective. Uh, that might be something that maybe is a, a short term uh, at, at helping to decrease risk by, you know, by awareness of the operator. But ultimately, the better solution is designing that risk out of the equation by, by making a design uh, change to the product. So there's a, an example there. As mentioned earlier, risk-based thinking has been an implicit to 9001 and the related standard, but the, ver the revisions will make it more explicit, more clear. Um, it's part of process approach. It's meant to include opportunities for improvement as well as um, kind of the, the negative view of risk. So proactive approach, protect the customer, improve your organization, be deliberate, be prepared. So those are kind of the really the the top level things to think about in this risk-based view. So one question that was brought up last week in one of our training courses is where do I start? You know, I'm, I'm a smaller organization or, you know, I've never had to use FMEAs before. I've never had to use maybe a C and E matrix or a fault tree or whatever. So I say the easiest place to start is a simple approach. So similar to using like that SWOT analysis tool, just look at an enterprise level. What are the major risks? I mean, you, do we have risk of um, natural disasters? Do we have risk of strike? Do we have risk of um, key employees uh, that um, you know are, are hard to replace and we only have one person in that particular role? So ask some of these questions and start from a very high level and then work your way down to um, a process level. So similar to looking at the kitchen, you know, let's, let's start very high in terms of the house and then work our way down to the kitchen being the highest risk room in the house. Um, and let's get everybody that's a user or stakeholder in the kitchen to evaluate the risk at more of a, a micro level. Um, as I mentioned with the illustration where the kid was trying to get into the swimming pool area, there's really a, a point of diminishing return here. You can't be – quality, quality practitioners fail at this a lot, and that's because a lot of times quality folks see the world in black and white. They have no concept of actual money. And, and so that's where I kind of shake them a little bit and go, look, uh, yeah, okay, so you could build a fence that's 10 feet high, but where's the money, money going to come from? So there is this um, point of diminishing return where you can say, look, I've taken reasonable enough provisions to mitigate that risk or to design the risk out. Um, anything else is just going to be a waste of money. So somebody said that the screen was on pause again. I'm not sure what's going on, if it's like pausing on its own, but um, 
Let me take you off mute. It's back up now. It's back up? Yeah. I'm not sure what slide it uh, went back on. It basically, when you went to uh, the mute, uh, that's when we lost oh. uh, control of seeing whatever you were presenting. You love technology. Yeah. <clears throat> so let me backpedal here just a bit. Um, there's the Prius, there's the slide on uh, origins of risk-based thinking, purpose, macro to micro, and then here's your an illustration from wearethepractitioners.com, just kind of looking at that point of diminishing return risk while considering time, energy, money, you know, other resources. Being aware of the fact that risk is is an aspect that that needs to be evaluated in concert with um, money and, and resources. You know, just be reasonable about your approach to risk. So here are some tools. Uh, FMEA, failure mode and effects analysis, CNE, um, and that could be fishbone, or there's also a CNE matrix, which is a different tool than a fishbone diagram, uh, fault tree analysis, SIPOC diagram, and turtle diagrams. I love turtle diagrams because turtle, turtle diagrams, uh, I've just never understood this, but I think it's fascinating. I, I've almost heard, uh, or seen two managers fight over turtle diagrams. No, I love them. No, I hate them. So I love to just promote turtle diagrams because for some reason, like quality dorks love to argue about the, the good or the bad of turtle diagrams, whatever. It's a tool. Use it. If you want to use it, if you don't want to use a turtle diagram, use a sip hoc. use something else. But these are just benchmarks that I've seen that are used uh, within industry. And, you know, I, I look at this lineup here, FMEA is a, is a very complex tool uh, compared to, you know, a SWOT analysis or, or a, a turtle diagram. These are tools, um, feel free to, to reach out, Google these tools. You can also see some um, blogs and papers on our website if you want to learn more. So 6.3 is, uh, change management. Within the next month or two, I'm going to do a um, one of these webinars where I do a deep dive in change management, um, similar to what I'm doing in risk management right now. But um, the idea here is that um, you need to plan changes, you need to control changes. If a change is is extreme, if there's going to be a, a a big impact due to a change, then you need to really take the time to evaluate the risk associated with that change. Okay. Um, there's also a, a document here that's highlighted that is um, ISO 31001. I would recommend doing a search for 31001. I would recommend buying 31001 um, because it's an entire standard on risk. It's risk management. So keep that uh, in mind as you move uh, towards the new standard. Uh, that document's a good resource uh, to put in your quality library. Um, knowledge. This is something that really replaces the word competency. So the idea here is that you um, you define the necessary knowledge needed to achieve conformity needed to effectively um, operate the the processes that are within your organization um, as they're intended to be executed. So you also need to make sure that your team members, your associates, interested parties have access to knowledge, access to work instructions, access to training. Um, you know, you don't have a big honk and binder that's locked in the uh, the uh, supervisor's office, you know, the the employees, the team members within your organization have access to that knowledge. Mm -hmm. One of the rules I try to use is you know, where the absence of a document or where the absence of specific training 
um, could cause a nonconformity, then you need to have a document or you need to have training. Okay. Um, Annex A, this is just more of a, uh, uh, you know, a, an add-on to the back of the standard for clarification of the new structure, new terms. Um, you know, here's what we mean throughout the earlier pages of this standard. That's really what Annex A is. Annex B um, is going to be very similar to what we see now, but we're going from uh, the current eight management principles to uh, principle one through seven. Um, so uh, the uh, system approach to management is, um, is, is gone. Um, we see instead of involvement of people, we see engagement of people. Um, this fight over continual versus continuous, which word should we use, that's going to go away because we're just simply going to see the word improvement used, which, again, I think is, is a good move. Um, Evidence-based decision-making versus factual approach, you know, show me the evidence. And then principle uh, number seven is relationship management. It's not just mutually beneficial relationships between you and your supplier, but this is a more broad relationship management between any interested parties that connect to, to uh, your organization. Employees, partners, uh, you know, contingency workers, suppliers, so it's more of a, a holistic principle than, than what we see the current principle eight is. NXC is um, the introduction to ISO 10001, which ISO 10001 is kind of the umbrella for um, quality management system documents and standards as a whole. And it's meant to um, help organizations in defining their QMS to drive organizational excellence and, you know, more so in line with the business management system movement rather than a quote unquote quality, traditional quality system. Um, so what are the next steps? The next steps are um, you know, two to three months away from the final draft international standard uh, being approved or voted on. And uh, then we should be looking at the um, approved standard September, October-ish. Um, so similar to the diagram that um, you actually couldn't see because the screen was was paused, but similar to, um, let me annotate this, similar to this timeline in terms of June 2012 to September 2015, that kind of three-year cycle, you'll see this three-year cycle once the standards released um, and that deadline for September 2018. So what are some resources that you can use? Obviously, I'm, I'm going to highlight some resources that we have because I think they're awesome resources, especially because they're free. And if you go to um, our website, which is a commoncenter.com, or you can just search concentric or whatever, um, you can, if you want to, subscribe to our updates and our newsletters, and you'll get you know announcements like our next webinar is coming up, or here's a new paper or article that's been published. I hate email because I get way too many emails every single day. But if you want, you can put your email address in here, first name, last name, hit subscribe, and you'll you'll get updates. Um, or like I said, if you don't want to do that because you don't need extra emails in your inbox, you can just click on uh, these articles. You can click on key links. Um, these are all hyperlinks to different articles, um, some written by um, our associates, um, some are not, um, and then key links are kind of under that. You'll also see um, right now, if you went to our website under this 9001 2015 resources page, you'll see the embedded video um, from the March uh, webinar. So within a few hours after this webinar today, um, Ronnie will have up 
the the recording from today. So that's where you'd come come back to uh, to view that. Um, this is the kind of the the permanent crew that's typically always in the office unless we're out and about on a project. Um, we have one other guy to add. His name's Michael. Um, he'll he'll be added to this. Um, he's actually graduating next um, next week from the College of Charleston, and we'll start here um, in in May. But here's how you get a hold of us. You can surprisingly enough, Facebook um, instant messaging has been very very popular for people to get a hold of me. It bypasses email. Like I said, I hate email. Um, because I get so many emails, I can't manage it. So if you're interested in connecting with me, Megan, Ronnie, or anybody else, um, here are various ways that you can do that. Um, I'm also um, Jim Thompson 2001 on just about any social media. Um, Ronnie made me actually create a Pinterest account, which I think is I don't know, a little bit wacky. But if you want to see what kind of shoes I like, whatever, you can, <laughs> you can, you can do that too. So, questions, comments, ridicules. Hey, Jim. That's good, Jim. Yeah, go for it. Go ahead. Jim, this is Jason uh, Kaiser. How are you Hi, doing? Hi, Jason. Hey, um, Jason. Question. Um, you indicated the ISO 31000 is the, the uh, risk based uh, thinking, you know, good tool there. Will this be yeah. something that's going to be changed also with the the current revisions of the ISO 9000, is there any linkages there? Um, it's a s totally separate document. I think um, what what you'll see is the other direction that 9001 has taken lessons learned from um, oh, okay. from you know from the other standard. Um, there is a I'm trying to see where this would be. Yeah, right here. Um, Risk-based thinking with ISO uh, 9001 2015 that um, one of our guys actually out of he's in Cincinnati now he's from your neck of the woods Jason okay. that that he wrote um, you may want to look at that it's a more comprehensive list of other documents sure um, as well as that that ISO 31001 um, but all right sounds good um, yeah here's the, the document now it's it's uh, 31,000, uh, 2009. So, you know, I don't know that it won't be upgraded, um, but it, it's not, the, the baseline of that standard is not 9,001. So, okay. Okay, good. Go, you had another question? Um, I wasn't sure if that was associated any with the, of course, the VDA requirements is what we are mm -hmm. uh, talking about, but that's- Yeah, uh, German QMS. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's okay. I'm, I'm good. I would I would assume that VDA will consider um, 9001, but VDA is uh, way more um, detailed, and you know obviously is country specific, just the German automotive manufacturing on highway stuff. But yeah, I will keep an eye on that as a question, just to see um, anything that pops up. Um, in my research, I typically okay. spend, you know, at least three or four hours kind of pulling information together and doing some reading each month. So if if I can spot anything, any papers or articles connecting VDA or connecting um, 31,001, I'll put those here and create a blog. Okay. So okay. Any, there was another question, I think. Okay. Underneath the articles and the key links, um, we don't have the dates here yet. That's something I'll get up by. I'll have Ronnie get up by the end of this month, um, which yikes, is actually tomorrow. Um, that will be where we'll see a listing. You can see a listing of other future forms. So, and then the other thing that I will do, um, this is already on my conference plan and kind of the takeaways is anything related to risk um, that I uh, can pick up at the world conference next week I will bring back anything that I can bring back and share with folks 
about uh, the 2015 changes. I'm specifically going to try to do some deep dive and recon on um, some sector specific changes. What you know, what are we going to expect in aerospace, automotive, some of these other you know healthcare standards and that sort of thing. So I'll, I'll bring that stuff back and you can always kind of see it here from our um, from our homepage. There's a little link right here that says ISO changes. That'll get you to the um, this reference center. So that's, that's another way to get to it. Any other questions? Comments, last call, any feedback at all? That was good, Jim. Okay, thank you. I'll have this um, recording posted uh, by the end of this week, hopefully get it up today actually. And um, you can uh, view it at any time. So also feel free to reach out to me uh, beware of email, obviously, but um, you can call the office, text me, whatever you want. If there's something I can do to help you out um, as you move forward, I'm happy to do so. So if there are no other questions. I'm going to go ahead and sign off and uh, have a great day. All right. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, thanks Jim. Take care. Thanks, guys. Yep. Bye-bye. Right.